Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Matt Horn is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. It was always going to end like this. All your hard work, all your sacrifice, only sped up the process. We have David Bateson talking to us from where are you talking to us from, David? I'm talking to you from Denmark, from Copenhagen. Hi, Matt. Really, David? Yep. <laughs> well, what a surprise. Yeah. I live here, and uh, don't tell anyone, but Scandinavia and Copenhagen, Denmark is the best kept secret in Europe. Don't tell anyone. Mm. Mm. Yeah, been here for a long time. Love the place. Well, obviously, I do have to ask the question, but I'm going to spruce it up a bit for the listener. You ready for this, David? Yeah. <laughs> obviously, with the fact that you are renowned for playing one such character in gaming, which we will get onto, that's fine. What would Agent 47 do in a COVID-19 lockdown? <laughs> okay, that's good. He wouldn't be wearing a mask. He's really not interested in anyone else's good health. So he would just be um, going about his business, you know, another day at the office. Death, 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 lunch, death, 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 dinner. That's the day in the life of Agent 47 under COVID restrictions. <laughs> Agent 47's got a good good way of social distancing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he has. You don't know what he looks like because if you do, then you're dead. <laughs> but uh, as I say, I don't think he's uh, he's incredibly interested in social distancing. <laughs> mm. He's either in disguise and you get, oh, it's Agent, oh, I'm dead. I usually ask the question, are you fully stocked up? Well, Agent 47 usually is fully stocked up. <laughs> yeah, I am. Whatever you're doing over in the UK, you're definitely getting it right with the, with the uh, vaccination for crying out loud. Mm. I think about three people in the and a dead dog have been vaccinated in Denmark. We can't get hold of the bloody vaccine. Will you stop hoarding it in the UK? I mean, I'm not going to get into politics or, or that kind no, of... No, don't go there. Yeah, stuff <laughs> okay. here. But bring the um, interview back to yourself directly. Yeah. How was 2020 for you? Oh, like a train crash. It wasn't as bad as a lot of other people. I have a kind of inbuilt isolation or self-isolation because I just have my... Um, recording studio which was around 250 meters from my door to my house and and i've now actually moved it back into my house into one of my bedrooms i couldn't get more isolated if i try everything's done on uh online you know source link or source connect i never see a customer except through a screen i just record remotely so um, it's a kind of a lonely life but it it didn't crash and hit a bridge or whatever that expression is until about the summer of last year and then i think all the production companies kind of ran dry for um voice work for a while in fact they're not closed on like the 11th or 12th of march last year i mean just shut down i don't know when it when the shit hit the fan for you guys in the uk but when it did i never got so much work in my entire life for the next month uh it's like the industry voice of industry just went everything's closing down call david give him work now and i i just worked literally around the clock mm. it was insane and then it all kind of dried up for a 
couple of months, two or three months. And then had a fantastic October, November, December. Bit of a slow start this year, but yeah, like it. Enough voiceover work to keep me off the streets. I mean, you mentioned about when it when it happened for us. I've got a sneaking suspicion, David, that the year what? anniversary is tomorrow. Oh, oh. <laughs> well, in Denmark, it was March 12th. We were shut down. They've just been talking about it. Yeah, because you were a little bit slow. Mm. Excuse me for saying it. Uh, you did a bit of an American. You did that Trump number. You know, what's COVID? It's just a flu. It'll be over by the spring. <laughs> and then uh, I think Boris woke up and went, oh, people are dying. What's it like now, by the way? You're all bloody vaccinated over there. What's going on? We're not all vaccinated. There's about 20 million of us who are vaccinated so far. The other thing I should mention here as well is that sort of parts of the UK came out of the lockdown and then went back into it. Yeah. But Leicester has been progressively in restriction for the last year. We've, we've had the full 12 months. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute, I knew that. The, the Midlands really um, really just like closed down and stayed closed down. I don't know why. You're just not behaving yourselves. I don't know what you're doing in the Midlands. What are you doing in Leicester? <laughs> you guys didn't ease up. I can't get my brain around this because, you know, ugh, the shops open here about the uh, start of this week. So some shops, things are starting to chill. Hmm. Hmm. Well, the reason why we've got you here, David, isn't to talk about COVID. Yeah, it's not to talk about. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's to talk about a little known franchise called Hitman. So, I mean, I'm going to start off a different way to the Hitman 3 interviews I've done so far. And I'm going to sort of announce here that last year was the 20th anniversary of Hitman. Yeah, it's true. It's hard to get my brain around this because... You know, I think I must have been four years old when I started. <laughs> <laughs> I'll believe it. Here's the thing. When uh, the four or five guys who started IO Interactive with their first game, Hitman, it was basically well thought through and planned and, and so on. But one of the, the driving forces behind it was that the guys were hoping that this would make some cash so they could work on other franchises, mm. other ideas that they had up their sleeve, uh, such as, which came about later, Freedom Fighters and Cain and Abel and, and a couple of other ideas they had. When the first game got reviewed, Code Name 47, yeah, 20 years ago, I think they were stunned in a good way and pleased by the you know, very good reviews they got. Um, because they set the bar really, really high right from the get-go. They didn't sort of dumb down and go, ooh, it's so easy to kill people. You just pick up this gun and you will get away with it. The thing kind of snowballed, uh, really, out of out of their wildest fantasies. And I remember a couple of years later, <laughs> at, at this building in Copenhagen, they had 200 programmers and level designers and, and people just employed from all over the planet. And I remember seeing the, the CEO, and he had this kind of stunned look on his face. And I, I remember going over to him and saying, you look a bit like, you know, you've been hit around the head. And he was just going, I can't believe this. We were all gathering to sort of uh, have a, some kind of a Christmas lunch or a celebration, and he was just going to make a big speech in front of everyone. He was just kind of taking it all in and going, what the hell has just happened in the last three to four, three years? By that time, they would put out two games. It was beyond their wildest fantasies. So, yeah, it's, um, it started well and, and, and got weller. Before we did the interview, I did a Google search with regards to gaming characters that yeah. have had this longevity. Solid Snake is one of them. Super Mario is another. You've got to be up there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm, I'm second. I think. Um, the Mario guy's done it for like 25, 26 mm. years. But um, I, thought I, I thought maybe I was the second mm. longest. Which, I don't know. I mean, what do I get? Nothing. I mean, I get a lot of wonderful attention and quite a bit of street cred in the game. But uh, that I will have to... Uh, live on because you know at least for now hitman's been um, set aside whilst the the guys and girls i interactive work on uh, their next big adventure the james mm. bond franchise 
<coughs> the planet knows about it. I mean, it's not coming out yet, but it's announced. The fans will want to know this answer, as do I. Have you ever played a Hitman game before? <laughs> okay, yeah, I have. I don't play them as much as I used to, because my life is a bit fuller. The only thing I haven't got round to is uh, virtual reality mm. on Hitman 3. Mm. And that's because uh, I Interactive is, uh, what do you call it, shut down. So I keep banging on the door going, let me in. It's 847. I know you're in there. They're not in there because uh, that's, that's the place to go. They have a whole floor just about now uh, of consoles. So I can anytime just go in and, and chill. But obviously I have my... I have my game at home, but I haven't tried virtual reality yet. Mm. Well, one of the things I suppose the fans will want to ask is, time permitting, would you ever consider doing a Twitch stream playthrough? You no, know, I wouldn't, actually. Yeah. Uh, and there's a reason. Yeah, and it's not because I'm in a bad mood or anything. It's because I'm just not good enough. And I think that's a killer. Put it this way. I was flown to London to present the Sniper Challenge Award at the Golden Joysticks. I think it was about four years ago, maybe five years ago. And I was allowed to walk around the room whilst they were having a final showdown, out of which came, you know, the Sniper Challenge world champion. And I got to see them murder that game in, in the Sniper Challenge uh, level. And then I swore to myself then, I went, okay, I may be the voice and I may be the face to a certain extent, but I cannot do what they do. So, no, I'm not going to humiliate myself and let down Agent 47 by being so crap at the game compared to the, the, the people who play it 24-7. It always sort of astonishes me when, when people say no, because, I mean, I asked David Kay who's known for Ratchet and Clank, yeah. I asked David Kay the same thing, would he ever consent to doing a <laughs> doing a Ratchet and Clank playthrough? Because obviously their history, their series, is, is almost as long as, as Hitman is. And he said he'd be, again, like you said, concerned about the amount of time it would take him to play through just one game. And my reaction to it was yeah. Nolan North, who you probably know, quite well-known voice yeah. actor, does a lot of mocap. He decided yeah. to play Uncharted, which is obviously what he's known for, Uncharted, as Nathan Drake. Yeah. And he spent yeah. 12 episodes <laughs> doing doing the whole game with... No way! Did he really? Yeah, with what would be considered a four-hour game playthrough. It took him 12 or 13 hours to do. I love that guy. Both of them. Uh, actually, last year, I booked my ticket to go over to the, the BAFTA Games because I wanted to meet up with them. And, uh, you know, it was heavily uh, nominated and they were going to be there. I just wanted to chat with them and say, hey, how are you doing? Way to go. I wouldn't do it. You know, there's a thing here. I really like Agent 47 oh. as a person. Um, that sounds maybe weird, but um, I feel very protective of him. So I don't want to I don't want to cock it up. You know, I don't want to treat him stupidly. One thing I did do for PlayStation once, and that was at a, at a press junket at IO Interactive over two or three days, and they invited like 28 journalists from all over the world. And they said, Dave, could you come on down? You can be a part of this whole thing. You know, we're going to be talking level design interviews and talking to the creative director and the sound people and the score and the, and the effects and so on. And, you know, we'd like you to have you on point. Um, as and when, to do some interviews and anything that, that's going to be asked of you as the voice of Agent 47. PlayStation had a couple of guys along, and they said, hey, asking the marketing people at I Interactive, would that be okay with I Interactive if David is allowed to freestyle as Agent 47 as we play the ghost mode level, where you get to kind of race through the, the level playing against yourself? <clears throat> and they, they talked about it very seriously. You know, and I was going, guys, I don't know if this is a good idea because, you know, if you let me loose in front of a microphone, it could get weird. And they went, no, no, this could be fun. Why not? And so they started playing it and they wired me up and off I went. It was fun. The results kind of went viral afterwards and everyone had a good laugh. 
And I said to them, okay, I did it in the character of Agent 47, but I was having fun. It worked out. But I wouldn't like to do it in a, in a serious way and not do him well, not do him justice. Hmm. That's what I mean. Hmm. You know, he's way too good for it. Now I'm going to ask the biggest question you'll probably have a oh my god answer to. You ready? <laughs> <laughs> Bring it up. Why do you think the Hitman series is so popular? Damn, that's a good question. I wasn't expecting that. I think two things. I think, getting back to what I mentioned earlier on, I think it's never ever dumbed down. It really demands a lot of the player, which is why I have such respect for the fans because they've really been pushed and pulled through all the hoops and whistles and bells that IO Interactive can throw at the player. It is not easy. It doesn't just work to kind of attack the game and try and do a Rambo and kill as many people. It just doesn't work that way. The level of skill has made the game intriguing for the fans who are all well-versed in single-person shooters. The other side of it, I think, has got something to do with me. And I say think because I can never really know. I can only see it from inside my own head. Uh, I don't know if the writers at IR Interactive, because we've all sort of grown up together. I don't know if they're writing a line thinking, oh, Dave will say this line really well, because we know how he'll say it. Or all together, we have really got to know this guy, Agent 47, who we care about tremendously. And that, somewhere in the, in the sort of recording and writing and creative process, has made this character genuinely real. Even though for someone who's, you know, a program test you killer, there is some humanity there. And it matters when he says something or when things happen. How did this come about? Is it the sound of the voice? Is it the music? Is it the graphics? Is it the storyline? Or is it the difficulty? It's a kind of melting pot of, of the whole thing. But there's somewhere I think my humanity as an actor or voice actor has, um, has helped flesh him out as a personality. It's the secondary thing. I think the first part is, is, the, is the level of difficulty that the fans have been put through and you know, the, the sheer technology of the game. So, yeah, that's the kind of long-winded answer to actually a very clever question. Mm. I mean, I was actually going to throw at you about the fact that isn't it culturally adaptive did you go to university or what yeah I did but the thing is it's, it's had 20 years and whilst series like super mario for example all for sort of kids i suppose with hitman you've had 20 years to sort of have a progressive storyline which let's be honest it has been rebooted once and by doing yeah. that it has become culturally adaptive i hadn't thought of it in those terms but um i think they've they've been clever in in appealing to the broad cross-section of hitman fans of hitman players uh you know they started off in a country let's face it denmark is 5.7 million people and they're making a game and they're going okay it's going to be it's going to be in english and we're going to set the bar very high so it's going to thin out the crowd right from the get-go what are our ambitions? And I think, getting back to that, that guy, the CEO, uh, Flossen, he, I think, was stunned on behalf of all of them that it had taken off to that extent. It had just gone off the scale. So how much of it was planned and how much has is, is just kind of grown because of the, the fans have just latched onto it. Every time I go to a, a gaming uh, convention of, of sorts, I am humbled by the, um, by the players' reaction and just how insanely dedicated they are to the game, to the franchise. And once, on one occasion, I saw the then owners of IO Interactive back at the EGX in Birmingham, I think it was 2015. I saw them, we're talking like a bunch of suits, really kind of take a body punch. They just went, do we own, do we own this? Oh, my God. God, you know, they got a real surprise by seeing the, the fan base up close and personal when we did a kind of meet and greet thing. Uh, and that 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 element is, is very hard to kind of, what's the word? Um, I don't know what the word is. It's very hard to 
calculate or, or to kind of predict. But okay, now I've got fans who contact me and say, "Listen, my own children are playing this game." That is, that's off the scale. Okay, I've got three daughters and two of them play it, and that's a bit weird. Dad, it's so cool hearing your voice in my head as I strangle this guy from behind. Something a bit wrong with this picture. Other than that, I'm I'm just blown away that uh, whatever that cocktail of uh, of you know the game being so kind of hard from the get go, uh, or the the technology advancement, or something about the personality, whatever it is, it definitely, in my opinion has been greater than, than what was expected, what was anticipated, and what was planned. Way to go, fans. Um, they've made it what it is. Mm, mm. Before we go into Hitman 3, obviously I do need to yeah. say that the Hitman series has also spawned, and before I go further with this, I didn't know <laughs> until doing what? Hitman 3 interviews that there were two live action films i only thought there was the one but there are in fact two hip hand films yeah and the travesty is is that you're not in either usually i would have thought that they would have had some sort of cameo-esque type <laughs> role sort of like a man yeah. who just walks past yeah then an alfred hitchcock number but no sadly not yeah you know that's just the way it is uh i came close on the first one and that was sadly partly due to the late great Paul Walker's unfortunate passing, and Luke Besson had taken over as the executive producer out of Paris, and suddenly the film had become much more a European film, which kind of pleased me and, and a lot of people, I think, because we just didn't want to see it go down the, you know, sort of Hollywood blockbuster thing. All right, let's have a, you know, bazookas at dawn and on Sunset Boulevard. You know. uh, it's called The Silent Assassin. So there was hope there, and I, I heard back that he was interested, Luke Besson, because they'd, they'd run a quite a big campaign about him being a legend, being unknown. No one knows what he looks like and all that stuff. So that opened up a few doors, and then there were a few other things. The guy who was the main villain uh, literally was my neighbor, uh, Ulrich Thompson, and we had the same bloody agent. I looked into his garden. And then the final thing that came into play was that the film was shooting in South Africa. And I'm going, I come from South Africa. Do I have to join the dots? <laughs> uh, but still, 20th Century was paying the bill. And they went, David who? And that's that's how Hollywood works. So, mm. um, you know, I, I respect that. Mm. They were shooting Deadwood series for 20th Century, and Timothy Oliphant was in the Deadwood series. So didn't have far to go. Hmm. So that's, that's just how it works. Given the fact it's one of those characters that you have, it's you, you've put all your blood and sweat and tears into it, you know, it's it's something that you're fond of as an actor. Yeah. What did you think of the films? <laughs> well, yeah, I got into trouble for this. <laughs> and here's the thing, just recently, about literally last week, no kidding. I watched some of uh, the first Hitman film again because uh, I did an interview last week. A question came up about who was the better of the two playing Agent 47. And uh, and then I read some of the comments that came out afterwards and obviously there was an overriding feeling, oh no man, they suck. But there was a lot of goodwill about the first film. I was pleasantly surprised because, remember, it was bloody well made. And the first time director, although he got fired from it, French director, my um, way of looking at it was, I look at it from an acting point of view. And um, no matter what the storyline is, they're all actors just doing their best, obviously. But I found the second Agent 47 more dangerous, though he looked less like Agent 47, if you want to, you know, be rude. He's a damn fine actor. His name's gone out of my head now. Brilliant actor. The first film, I think, was kind of better action sequences and stuff. It was a bit weird with the love interest stuff that they try to brew up. That's, again, Hollywood. But uh, no offense to Timothy Oliphant, who did a, a brilliant job. 
I preferred the second uh, Agent 47. It was more dangerous. It's a kind of mixed answer, really. Was it Rupert Friend, by the way? Yeah, it was. Yeah. And he was so bloody good in the Homeland series. You know, he'd already proved himself to be a, a CIA killer. What? Rupert Friend? You kind of got the feeling when he was in the room, he just going, OK, everyone, just run. Run now. It's not going to end well for you. And Timothy Oliphant looked brilliant. He was very loyal to the character. I just had a slight issue with him looking kind of a bit too young when he had his hairline, you know, was removed to be to be the bold assassin. Mm. But um, no, he did a fine job. Mm. Well, I'm going to sort of slightly get into trouble now myself. And... Go for it. Get into trouble. <laughs> do it. Go on, do it. Push that baby off the cliff. I mean, obviously, the the well known franchise, the well known gaming franchises have all started to get series being produced by netflix and amazon prime mm -hmm. yeah could they do a hitman one i think they could well they are already working on it in la but it's gone away i don't know what's happened to it but there is a tv series in the making either it's just been shelved like a lot of productions you know due to COVID, obviously, or they've run out of money or creativity or whatever. And I did hear that they want to offer me something in a in a cameo role capacity, but I don't know if even if that's true. That's just what I have been told. And that that would be fun. Oh look, there he is, you know, the weapons expert or whatever. I'll jump at it. I mean, it would be it would be such a cool thing. And I think it will come about. In fact, it would be weird if it didn't come about. I think it's just been shelved. Uh, I don't see anything out there on uh, IMDb in terms of it being in pre-production or, or anything at all. So it's it's just, as they say, gone away for mm. the time being, mm. as far as I know. Well, I mean, this is the word I don't like using in these interviews, which is multiverse. Does Hitman have its own multiverse, being the fact that it's a reboot of a reboot of a reboot? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to say. Mm. It would be a brain dead decision to drop Hitman as a as a franchise. Yeah, you know, it's just a license to print money. So Hitman, Hitman's definitely going to be there in the future. Yeah, I'm sure of it. Yeah. So obviously, we get onto Hitman Three. Which is obviously the newest instalment, released at the end of January. Obviously, you'd done two already of the actual trilogy, the Assassin's Assassination Trilogy, they called it, wasn't it? Yeah, the World of Assassination. Yeah. Which is basically, you know, the one story arc. Yeah. Just split up into three films. Yeah. So, my question for you, really, because obviously most of the time I usually say, what was it like working on the game? For you, was it like putting on a pair of slippers, basically, and saying, let's get to work. Well, yeah, yeah, in the sense that I felt I was, um, you know, going to meet, hang out and work with my friend, mm. uh, Tobias Reaper, you know, uh, Agent 47, who I know very well. So in that way, it felt very comfortable. But I was also really intrigued to see what was going to happen. Because this, for me, was like my eighth game in 20 years. And I don't know how it ends. <laughs> until, well, until I got the third script. Doing Hitman 1, oh, man, this is so cool. And then Hitman 2, oh, no, you can't stop me now. And then having to kind of count the days and months uh, until they sent me the, the script for the, the third film. And funny enough, you know, in the past... Uh, I haven't normally had access to the whole story before we start the recording process, um, which in the last I don't know, four games at least is a process that takes four to six months from my point of view uh, in terms of recording. I'll do it like a four-hour sitting normally. And next time I'm called in, we'll do some pickups from the previous session. Things have changed, a couple of line rewrites, and then we'll do another level. Uh, also, so I never got to know what was going to happen, and I actually didn't want to know. The only thing I needed to know was what happened before, mm. and that's fine by me. So I just get the lines for that scene and for that level, and I'm going, 
fine. Don't tell me. La, 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 la. I actually don't want to know. But when we got to um, Hitman 3, I was nearly kicking down the door and going, will you give me that script? I can't stand it any longer. I didn't know how this was going to end. So that was great. And obviously then I read it cover to cover. I'm going, ah, oh, finally. Good. I mean, with technology, with yeah. technology across the last 20 years or so, obviously it was in blocks and polygons in 2000 era. And then obviously subsequently you've had mocap, obviously you know, yeah. get introduced. Did you get to do any sort of mocap on the latter latter games? You know what? Sadly not. I had one opportunity, and I was in Atlanta uh, at the Voice Arts Awards, which is like, I think it's the world's biggest voiceover conference. And uh, and they called me from IO Interactive in Copenhagen and said, David, listen, um, we want you to swing by London to do some motion capture work. Can you change your, your flight tickets? And I went, yeah, can I? <laughs> Just hold the line. And uh, I said, I'll get back to them. Uh, and I, I you know, set about sort of uh, changing my flights. And they called me back a couple of hours later, or later that day anyway. And they said, uh, David, David, stand down, stand down. You don't need to change your tickets. I went, what? So I've never done motion capture work for Agent 47 which is going to piss me off for the rest of my life. Mm. On the other hand, uh, for many years, the guy doing the motion cap work in Copenhagen is a very good friend of mine. Mm. He's a stuntman slash actor. So um, that was fun because I'd you know, meet up with him for a beer and stuff. Again. You'll never believe what I did today. And I went, oh, no, don't tell me. You know, Okay, do tell me, do tell me. Mm. So, yeah, I, I never got to do it. Bum. You mentioned about the fact how successful the game is as a result of you doing the voice do you regret not having sort of the the actual model as well i don't regret you know it was like a missed opportunity mm. a bit like you know the first hitman film game come on that was a no-brainer give me a chance but you know they did well let's face it i'm not a stuntman and the guy who motion captured me is a professional stuntman so, uh, you know, he could do anything. I just wish I'd had a crack at it. But I did other things, so mm. I'm cool. The question, I suppose, the fans will want to know, and you won't know the answer, I don't know the answer. We've already talked about the Hitman TV series, obviously. Yeah. <clears throat> do you think another game? What, there will be another game? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I do. In fact, I'm sure of it. Nothing's been said to my face. Uh, directly but as I said this game made its money in about three days after it came on the market so if there's anyone with half a brain going oh do we need money for the next game development yeah. yes we do don't kill that series don't kill the franchise mm. no no it would be totally bizarre if there was not to be another hitman at some point but as for when and and who's going to be voicing it, uh, that is unknown. We all like to think we're going to wake up tomorrow, but some of us are going to be in for a surprise. Mm. So, no, I, I don't know. I would think the game's coming back, definitely. I'll shave my head. We'll both, both go and do mocap <laughs> together. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You know what? Uh, here's the thing. Last year, uh, or was it the year before? November 19, I was nominated for a... a Voice Arts Award in in, uh, in L.A. And I was up for a, an award, uh, which is like, this is a kind of the voiceover Oscars for Agent 47. And I went, okay, this I'm not going to miss. And I flew over for the day because I had to get back to Copenhagen to do a, a theater production uh, performance. And I was, I was just blown away about how the the industry has grown i mean i know it's grown but when you find it find yourself on a you know stretch limo and a red carpet and all the you know the <laughs> all the glitter and plastic of of uh, hollywood we have come a long long way and that cheers me up about the future of gaming and and the future of motion capture and voice acting being taken more and more seriously and let's face it 
the gaming industry. What the hell has happened in not just the 20 years of Hitman, but um, let's go back 25, 30 years. That's like two millennia in terms of you know computer game evolution. So I'm just over the moon about whatever's going to happen in the future because it's beyond our wildest fantasies, and that's 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 what kind of gives me a thrill. You know, I don't know what's going to happen next, or, or in a way, no one knows. It's just if you can think it, it, it can be done. Mm. You, know, you can write a program for it. In 2015, when I was at EGX, and um, what's the oh God? The, one of the big, I think it was the Star Wars franchise. It came out with a, um, a virtual reality console, and gamers had to book three or four months in advance to get like 15 minutes on the console, you know, uh, over that four-day convention. And uh, I remember standing there watching these people sort of flaying their arms around and saving the, the galaxy. Uh, I'm thinking, wow, I bet there's something really good going on inside the head of that player, because on the outside just look crazy, you know, a madman having a quiet epileptic fit with a, you know, mm. a pair of heavily set sunglasses on his face. But that's what I mean about the, the imagination. Where, where does it end? How do you define what can't be imagined? Mm. And I think that's what thrills me most about the, the computer game industry. Mm. I mean, technically, now they can be you, I suppose, with the whole VR experience. You know, I am him. At the same time, I think also like I'm next to him, you know, like I know it's me and I'm voicing him and I just know, you know, no, no, no. Or even the, the, the writers or the director will say that to me and they'll go, no, and nine times out of 10, we will choose the right take together. I normally do three takes of every line. We end up choosing the same take, you know, every time. So we're all in sync with what that person's like, but. This would be really something different if I had the gloves on and the, and the, and the virtual reality glasses, mm. and then I'd be, I would be Agent 47. Mm. I'd probably never come back. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, I do have to ask the question. Obviously, it's not just purely, you know, integral to Hitman 3. It's across the board, across the whole 20 years you've been doing it. Yeah. Are there any sort of funny anecdotes you can share about the production of the franchise? A million things, really, but they're all kind of small, subtle, and sometimes, in a way, almost private moments. Um, I think the best way of describing it is how other people see it. One thing, we had an elusive target in, uh, in Hitman 2, which was Sean Bean, world-famous film actor and bloody brilliant we were at the Paris Games together and Warner Brothers then was distributing it and they were doing a fantastic job in the sense that they just went totally Hollywood on it and hired a whole floor at Le Bristol a five star hotel in downtown Paris and you know we schmoozed and did interviews every eight minutes <laughs> that nearly killed me he was totally killing it we just said yeah this is what we do when we do it uh, a big PR stunt before a feature film's released. But what blew his socks off was when he came outside and there were four huge Fijians in uh, smoking, uh, you know, black and white tuxedos. And and they, they came up to us, oh, bloody hell, you look like a silhouette. And they went, oh, monsieur, we are going to be your bodyguards. I'm going, oh, okay. <laughs> and I remember Sean Bean saying, no, I don't, I don't think that'll be necessary. <laughs> Thinking, you know, a bunch of gamers, all 14-year-old children, what's all this, you know. <laughs> and there were thousands or hundreds at least crowded outside the entrance to the hotel. And uh, the limos or the big black sort of vans were called in one at a time when we were sort of bundled out through the door and racing behind these uh, big Fijians <laughs> and bundled into these vans. Sean Bean didn't even make it. So that was his first introduction to gaming fans. You know, mm. He just got accosted on the street and had to stop. When we got to the Paris Games, it, it was it was insane. I remember at one point, just before we were going to go on stage, because we were going to do some uh, interview 
with some some people from some I I interactive. We had a level design, and then we had a creative director and one other person, and Sean Bean obviously as the main attraction, and myself going, "Hey, I'm the ball guy." He was standing at the top of the steps backstage, and uh, this French you know host was going, "That they are the Sean Bean," <sighs> and the crowd went mental. And at that point, Sean turned around. He came back down the stairs and said, yeah, on second thoughts, I think you should go first. <laughs> I went, why? He said, they're going to tear us apart. <laughs> For me, that was a kind of quiet little, or not so quiet, reminder of the the magic or the, the, the hugeness of the franchise because uh, it kind of took him by surprise as a worry seasoned you know famous actor going bloody hell computer gamers you know so yeah power to power to this business it's scary mm. have you ever been noticed on the bus yeah i have actually oh. um i get a couple of times in copenhagen but it's, it's happened to me in, in strange places it happened to me in the apple shop <laughs> on fifth avenue right there opposite i think it's the waldorf hotel that was a bit weird they have a big sort of flagship Apple store there. And um, obviously, you know, the people working there are, are a lot of intense gamers. And I was there, and they went, excuse me, sir, are you who I think you are? I think what first maybe makes the connection is they hear my voice, and then they kind of look at you and they're going, oh, my God, it could be. And then they have to ask, you know. Uh, it's not because I have a tattoo on the back of my head or something. You know? <laughs> Although I came very close to getting one. One of the points I was going to make earlier on when I was at the uh, Voice Arts Awards, I nearly came this close to getting a tattoo on the back of my head. Yeah, that's ha happened to me at a bus stop on the London Road in Twickenham, a Hounslow actually. And it happened to me in a sound studio in London when I was recording a Lego voiceover. The sound technician says, uh, I'm in a glass booth with a window looking through to the, the the producer and the sound engineer and, and he just hears the sound engineer not even looking at me just going okay give us a sound check please and I read up the first couple of lines from what was a Lego commercial and I suddenly saw him stiffen up <laughs> and then he looked in the window he was miming are you and I just nodded the clients in the room so we couldn't talk privately and I just knew I just said to him I know what you do in your private life. So, yeah, in, the, in bizarre places, it happens. it's happened to me on a plane, on a train at Paddington, on Paddington Station. That was fun. But it's normally the voice that triggers the kind of going, oh, oh, I've heard that voice before. And then look around and then happen to see a bald guy. Wait a minute, he could be. I'll have to ask. And then mm. I get physically recognized more in Denmark because I'm a bit more known uh, as him mm. over here. Mm. But, yeah. I mean, I was going to say, you know, Lego have done the video game series of Lego in terms of Indiana Jones and Star Wars, whether they do yeah. Lego Hitman. <laughs> I think they'd have a real moral dilemma. It came out just recently that um, it was the biggest, most quoted meme in 2020. Uh, a man has fallen into the river from Lego City. And people go, oh, my God, that's the guy that is Hitman. Then I sort of researched it on, on TikTok and mm. oh, flipping heck, the whole planet has been saying this expression, this sentence. Uh, see, I did Lego for 10 years. So um, all of Lego, actually. So mm. I even did Lego, the Raiders of the Lost Ark. So it's funny you should mention that. Mm. But it was mainly uh, Lego City and Lego Star Wars. Mm. And some others as well. Well, obviously, we're coming vastly to the end of the interview. I've got to ask the question, what made you want to get yeah. into the industry and what advice would you give to anyone wanting to pursue it? Oh, sort of got into it by accident, both in acting and also voiceover acting. Uh, I was 19. My mom actually said, listen, Dave, you're studying at university. Uh, this is in South Africa. And radio drama was very big over there. And she said, hey, why don't you get onto the local radio station? Maybe they need some new young voices, you know, to play the juve leads and all those kind of things. And the radio dramas. And I went, what? So I did, and I got in. That's how I started in front of a microphone. But it was also whilst I was studying drama and English literature and psychology and all those, sociology and those kind of stuff at, at university. But I didn't think I was going to become an actor. 
I thought I'd be doing something behind the scenes, some kind of a you know producer or a I don't know maybe even a cameraman. Just I was happy to do that. And one thing led to another, and I um, found myself auditioning for the National Theatre, and I got in. And that's kind of where I went, oh, okay, oh, guess I should take this seriously now. It wasn't a childhood dream to be an actor at all. As, in terms of advice, man, this is a tough one, because in terms of acting, 80% of the industry drops out before they turn 30. So it'll be a lot easier <laughs> after the age of 30. That's some statistic I read years ago when I was living in London. But I will say only one thing about this. If you don't do what you really have a passion for doing, then you are literally wasting your life. It might not succeed, but you've got to trust your instincts and and uh, pursue your dreams. You've got, you've got to, you just got to, you owe it to yourself. And, and the last thing I would say in terms of advice is just don't accept no for an answer. I had a really good piece of advice many years ago, and I forgot it until about a, 10 days ago. It came up in some conversation, and it was this. I went to a, a kind of an acting course at the Actor Center in Tottenham Court Road 150 million years ago. And we were listening to this well-known actor who had an incredible strike rate in terms of getting jobs, you know, auditions, and then getting the job. And he said, which I remember was extremely irritating at the time, but was very true. He said, I don't have the problem. When I go to an audition, I don't have the problem. They do. I'm going to help them with their problem. I'm going to solve their problem for them. And his attitude then changed from being desperate out-of-work actor to that of being actually nearly the person who was employing them. So psychologically, it just tricked his brain to not be nervous and just to get, okay, I've got this five-minute audition or ten-minute audition. I'm going to just relax and give as best as I can, and I'm going to help them with their casting dilemma. And I went, okay, good advice. <laughs> I should remember that. That's not the way you normally go in. You just go into an audition situation as a, as a victim, sort of walking dead. Put me against the wall and shoot me and tell me I didn't get the job. Instead of going, I'm here to help you. Now, this is how I'm going to help you. And then you audition. So, yeah, if you're starting out, if it's voice acting or just acting, try and turn the, the psychological fear factor on its head and uh, I think it actually helps that's what I do the other thing as well is obviously I usually ask talented well, people who've got a legacy behind them like yourself David are there any roles that you haven't done yet that you would like to do see this question is is would you want another game or would you <laughs> like to do something a bit different no actually no I would I would love another game and even as we speak uh uh, there are things afoot. Mm. Uh, I, I have I have a London agent, a voice agent. We know that you know I'm in the market now for obviously uh, another gaming adventure. So who knows? I have a another agent who's uh, sort of banging my drum in Los Angeles. So who knows? But yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely up for for another gaming franchise. Mm. Um, ready to go i i love it because as i said to you earlier the possibilities are just endless and okay i can never hope to imagine to be involved in a game for such a long time again but um i i love that kind of sense of endless fantasy that's possible in, in the gaming industry that kind of really rocks my boat and uh, so yeah i'm i'm up for another game you are an on-screen actor as well we should mention that I think one of the projects yeah. you were in was called Headhunter, which I found quite ironic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it took me a long time to realise that. What the hell? I'm in a film called Head... I'm in another one called The Bodyguards. Yeah. And I'm going, The Bodyguards? Bloody hell, I've killed so many bodyguards. What am I doing in this film? <laughs> in TV series. But, um, yeah, I, I tend to play villains, which is fun. They're often a lot more fun. Than other parts, but um, 
you don't necessarily live a lot longer, or it doesn't normally end well for you. I'm shooting a TV series at the moment, which is a real challenge, because I'm playing a symphony orchestra conductor. He's a right pretentious twat. Tomorrow, Thursday, I've got a day's workshop for the conductor to teach me how to conduct. And then next week, I've got my last two days on the set where I'm going to be conducting 106 musicians, the National Sym Symphony Orchestra of Denmark. So mm. that's going to make my blood pressure boil because <laughs> you're standing there in front of all these people going, okay, this could go horribly wrong. Please tell me there's another conductor just out of shot. Oh, thank God there is. Yeah. But yeah, so those things that kind of happen, you know, in the, in the business of acting, those challenges I love. So um, bring it on. If anyone's interested in becoming an actor, do it. Do it. Do it. Would some Matt Horn advice help you, David? Yeah. Yeah. Bring it on. So, obviously, you are in a scene on Thursday, I think it is, I think you said, which is conducting a symphony orchestra. You have a bat on and you're sort of winging it around everywhere. Yeah. When you're conducting, just think of this moment, and remember I said it. When you're conducting the orchestra, just look at the people around you and think, sniper rifle, <laughs> garroted. <laughs> I could kill you with my bare hands, you exactly. peasant. You may be able to play the flute, but... I've locked the doors. <laughs> now, do your best, because I'm going to kill the first banjo that gets it wrong. It'll be an adventure. I'm going to ask you, as a final question, before we do the one-minute plug, you mentioned about the fact, yeah. about a couple of minutes ago, that you always play villains. Yeah. Mm. Would you consider Agent 47 a villain? No way. I would call him a problem solver. <laughs> and I've never been asked that question. I guess the closest to a villain in terms of Agent 47's personality is that you know, he kills people for a living. He takes money for killing people. But uh, no, he's not a villain. I mean, nowadays the idea of villain is a bit misshaped. There's a line now which is sort of blurred. And so whilst you can be a villain, you can also be misguided and conflicted. Yeah, yeah but I mean, I don't think he's... A misunderstood, you know, orphan that was left on the streets or was beaten by his parents. He was made. Mm. He was made to kill. For me, that removes the uh, the moral um, question. And you know, here's the thing: getting back to assassins who are paid for, you know, by their country, the mm. CIA. Mm. If it was uh, Rupert Friend in, in the Homeland, or if it was a MI5 guy called Mr. James, what's his name? <laughs> Double O. You know, they're, they're being trained and paid for by, by governments to uh, make other people's hearts stop beating. It could be questionable. I think you'd be hard-pressed to, to find, to get many people to say that they're villains. Mm. Which, there lies a moral. Mm. Emma. Mm. Oh. <laughs> I think the fans yeah. will probably go... Mm, I never thought of it like that before. <laughs> yeah, everyone's out there, you know. I do the voiceovers for a um, for a company which comes from a country which expresses great passivity uh, as a kind of um, national ethic, you know, always remaining neutral and not getting involved in political conflicts or physical conflicts for that matter. And <clears throat> I brought it to the attention. As I'm doing the voiceover, wait a minute, don't you guys make the um, the guiding systems for drone missiles? <laughs> and there was this long, awkward silence. <laughs> they went, oh, shit, he's found us out. <laughs> uh, we'll never be able to look at ourselves in the mirror again. <laughs> Believe it or not, I still do the voiceover for them. Mm. But, uh, yeah, so, you know, that moral dilemma is, is a very thin line, often. Well, I'm going to give you a one-minute plug, David. A one-minute plug to plug Hitman 3 and anything else you've got coming up subject to NDAs. Uh, it'll be a very short one minute. There's very little I can say apart from promoting uh, uh, Hitman 3 because my NDAs are longer than my contract, <laughs> which is, like, so boring. But yeah. uh, And often, uh, just on that note, I... Um, 
uh, am requested to, you know, send any interviews I do that, that I interactive have not authorized to them so that they can go, okay, no one died in this interview. No children or animals were harmed in this interview. We will let Matt Horn live. <laughs> what I'm saying is, I mean, they know me well enough to know that I wouldn't now, but uh, it's more a sensitive up to the up to a premiere of a game where I could go and say something stupid like, you know, the policeman did it. But I'm sure they would probably appreciate a heads up. This is David Bateson, otherwise known as Agent 47. I strongly encourage you to watch Hitman 3. Not only to watch it, but to play it from start to the end. If you don't, I will find you. And when I find you, I will kill you. To quote Liam Neeson, mm. taken. <laughs> mm. Well, it's been a pleasure interviewing you, David. Yeah, and uh, likewise, really. Thanks mm. for that. We'll have to get you back, David. Yeah, do. But uh, just keep looking out there because you're going to be hearing from me. Uh, or rather, what I'm up to. Probably sooner than rather than later, but I, I can't say anything. So, uh, yeah, I will have a reason to talk to you. Let's just put it like that. Mm. Thanks very much for your time, David. Pleasure. You take care, man. Bye-bye now. Bye now.